Brad's not here. Oh. <laughs> you know, you're too good at Welcome home, Brad. Or, you know, you know. <laughs> good evening. Welcome to the November 20th, 2019 North Idaho College Board of Trustees meeting. Would you all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Trustee Howard, would you read the mission statement? Happily. North Idaho College meets the diverse educational needs of students, employers, and the northern Idaho communities it serves through a commitment to student success, educational excellence, community engagement, and lifelong learning. Thank you. We do have a quorum this evening. However, uh, Trustee uh, Murray is unable to attend tonight. Has everyone had an opportunity to review the minutes? And if there are any changes to the minutes, please say so, or we will accept them as written. All right, minutes are accepted. That takes us immediately to uh, public comment. And uh, Mr. Geringer, correct? from the governor's office. We're so pleased you're back to join us. Please come forward. <laughs> Chair Wood, members of the Board of Trustees, good evening. For the record, Jake Geringer, North Idaho Field Director, Office of the Governor. So I just wanted to return this evening to attempt to address some of the questions that were raised last time on the 30th of October regarding the governor's recent budget. Uh, so as you all know, there has been a 1% rescission to the fiscal year 2020 budget and a 2% base reduction for the fiscal year 2021 budget. The governor's position on this spending reset is that the goal is to better align state spending growth with anticipated state revenue growth in the coming years in an effort to be prudent with the people's money. For the point about whether the revenue, if the revenue ultimately comes in higher than anticipated, the answer to that is it will not be restored in either fiscal year 20 or fiscal year 21. The effort in this is to identify inefficiencies within state spending. To the point of the inverse cycle that exists between demand on higher education and the economy, again, the purpose of this budget reset is to make strategic reductions in good times in order to mitigate cuts that will inevitably occur during a recession in down economic times. So the goal is to soften the blow now while the times are good. Regarding the point of foregone taxes, and if the governor has a position on potential changes to those, the answer is no. He does not have a position at this time. Regarding CTE funding, uh, I have been informed that CTE, the CTE budget has continued to increase year over year over the last several years. And so with that, I stand for any questions or further comments from you. Well, first of all, thank you so much for, for carrying forward our questions to the governor's office and coming back here tonight to address us. And so, Certainly. board, I would open it up to questions. So kind of you to come. Trustee Howard. Um, just kind of echoing some comments that we had a few moments ago. Um, the CTE issue, historically, uh, it's my understanding anyway that the state had committed historically to cover the entire cost of CTE. Um, which included the facilities. And historically, that's not happening. I mean, our, our CTE facility was paid for by uh, the college and the foundation. Um, and so my question, I guess, is that although the funding has stayed the same, it is not up, in, I don't think, anyway, it's up to its historical promise of what it was to, to have been when we undertook the, um, the CTE um, programs. I, I mean, my understanding is that the state was going to pay the entire cost of that. So if you could explore that for us um, 
and maybe, if necessary, correct my understanding, um, or maybe get, help us understand it better. Than, I'd appreciate that. Sure. Uh, any further? Or? No, ma'am. No? Thank you so much. Thank we you. do appreciate you coming and making uh, an coming. effort to keep connecting with us. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, that takes us on to celebrating success, paving the way to Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Jeremy, uh, what's the full last? Seda. Seda. Thank you. My, my thing is kind of cut off on the name. So. Good evening, Chair Wood, member of trustees. Uh, it is my uh, honor tonight to introduce a gentleman in our IT department who's really taken our accessibility needs at NIC to the next level. Uh, similar to what I spoke with last month about the accessibility policy, uh, Jeremy's been really inter instrumental in that. And then as part of the funding we received from the state, uh, Jeremy was really the kind of the brains behind bringing this event to life. Uh, so with that, I'd just like to introduce our accessible technology coordinator, Mr. Jeremy Seda. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Chair Wood, trustees, President McLennan, and guests. Uh, my name is Jeremy Seda, as Ken mentioned here, and um, I'm the IT Accessibility Coordinator here at North Idaho College, and here to talk about celebrating the success of PAVE the Way to Global Accessibility Awareness Day 2019. That's a mouthful, so um, I'm just going to call PWGAD through most of this presentation, save us all some time. <laughs> so. So why do we do an accessibility event? Uh, we want to provide ad advocacy for people with disabilities and who have struggles with digital inclusion, build awareness of accessible technology that NAC is providing to stakeholders, <clears throat> guide NAC staff in an active role towards accessibility. Because what right now what we have is we have a, a few people that know a lot about accessibility. And what we really need here is a lot of people that know a little bit about it. It's pretty good, right? I invented that, and Matt May from Adobe also says that. <laughs> so how did the accessibility event come to be? Um, it made the most sense to align this event with an existing holiday and global accessibility awareness day, or GAD, was a natural fit. So first, let me give you a little bit of background on GAD. The first GAD was actually in May of 2012, and the idea started with a single blog post by a Los Angeles web developer by the name of Joe Devon, and he was expressing his frustrations and over inaccessible websites. And so he said it would be nice to have a holiday where we really try to celebrate digital accessibility and try to um, bring awareness to this issue that's plaguing any, anything online. And uh, another gentleman by the name of Jenison Asuncion, um, uh, he's an pro accessibility professional originally from Toronto, got to the blog post via Twitter and contacted Joe. They both tapped into their respective networks um, in order to realize the event and have it come to fruition. GAD has become an internationally recognized holiday with celebrations shared by people and institutions in 30 plus countries worldwide. <laughs> Uh, companies like Apple actually celebrate it in every one of their stores on the day of GAD. Accessible products like the Xbox One Adaptive Controller are commonly scheduled to release on Global Accessibility Awareness Day as well. GAD happens on the third Thursday of May, um, which ended up being a little problematic for us because that's the day before commencement. Mm -hmm. And if I wanted any help, <laughs> I had to do something about that date. So we decided to host the event a few weeks prior to the actual Global Accessibility Awareness Day, and that seemed to be the best option. So in a sense, uh, NIC is, uh, NIC's event would pave the way to Global Accessibility Awareness Day. In that, we were um, helping raise awareness of and participation in the worldwide community of GAD. And uh, really, we wanted to share effective ideas with others, uh, celebrating GAD in, in a way that's most effective. And um, for those who couldn't actually attend in person, then we wanted to have a live stream to you know, further the reach of this event. Okay. 
So in talking about the successfulness of GAD, uh, I kind of have to attribute this to a good mindset, and um, please allow me to go on a quick tangent. Uh, one of my passions is to um, is that I teach the grappling martial art of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, or BJJ, again, saving time. And one of the things I've learned in 12 years of doing the sport is that, you know, when you're in a really bad situation and you want to focus on making it 100% better, you're going to fail. And um, that's kind of indicative of a lot of things in life. However, if you can see how to make a situation 1% better, do you think maybe you can see how to make it 2% better? And if you can see how to make it 2% better, maybe you can see how to make it 5% better, and it builds from there. So, another good one, right? Yeah. I invented that. <laughs> James Foster says it. Whoa, let me go back. James Foster says it too. <laughs> uh, so one of the really good examples of that mindset making one, things 1% 1 better was our tactile event passport. So we had an event passport. Um, as you've uh, seen in any event where you go around to get it stamped, that's great. But we thought, well, we need to, the PWGAD committee was sitting around saying, well, we need to have a tactile version because we know there's going to be people who are blind and low vision attending the event. So then I, I created this swell form example, which had been passed around to some of you. And, um, it's uh, actually using a technology called picture in a flash. We just call it a swell form printer. And when you print wherever it's black on the sheet, it swells. And then um, instead of stamping, we actually had these individual round labels with the stamps on there. And the purpose was that uh, somebody who's blind low vision could still feel that sticker and know which booths they still need to visit. <clears throat> then the question was raised about, uh, well, do we provide both versions, or what we would want to do, and uh, that got answered pretty quickly with uh, Jackie Stallings from Idaho Commission of the Blind and Visually Impaired (ACBVI) again, saving time, <laughs> and she said, "You know, I can count on one hand how many times I've gone to an event, and the materials like, I didn't have to ask for extra materials to meet my needs, and so that pretty much settled it that we were just going to provide the tactile version of the passport." So in doing so, it's universally designed, which was a big deal to us. We, we want to be sure that we're accessible, but universal design is the goal. And it's been a great advocacy tool for everybody else who you know, attended the event. Mike Colton from Communications and Marketing helped us design a beautiful event poster. And I really insisted uh, that Mike include these tear-off information cards at the bottom and uh, I kind of wish Mike had fought me on that a little bit because uh, after I had hand brailed, <laughs> hand brailed about 30 posters, um, yeah, I was, I was kind of thinking there's got to be a better way to do this. <laughs> we met our goal of 25 exhibitors, and I, I would love to go through all these if I had the time because they were excellent exhibits, but I'm going to highlight a few. Um, I felt very lucky and blessed to actually have 15 of the exhibits come from internal employees to NIC. That made me feel really good, like there's people who think this is important. We had two student success stories, uh, a young lady that um, was providing resources, the accessible resources that she had made for by the Disability Support Services Office um, for her STEM classes. Another one who was showing the process of computer-aided drafting with his assistive technologies. And we had excellent external stakeholders as well. Uh, I want to just kind of highlight a couple of them. Ednetics was uh, one that uh, came together, had an exhibit, but also ended up being the largest donor towards the event. And um, I did ICBVI, Idaho Commission for the Blind, Visually Impaired. Jackie Stallings, she actually wanted to be here. She had said yes, and then she realized she double booked herself for an event that's out of town. So um, we at least wanted to show you a snippet of something she had to say about the event. <laughs> well, Jackie, thank you so much for being here and sharing some more information with us. I also want to just personally thank you for all the work that you've done to help us make this event so successful. Uh, you've been instrumental in joining us with the community, and just thank you for all that you do for um, all the people in the state of Idaho. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure working with you guys. We love how accessible this event is. It's fantastic. Um, when I go get my lunch today, it's going to be braille, so I know what I'm picking out. Um, our tactile 
passports that students are taking around can be felt by people who are blind or visually impaired. And, and North Idaho College has been the most progressive um, institution I've ever worked with when it comes to global access. Thank you. Thank you. Whoops. So that was a. Uh, that wasn't scripted. That was a pretty remarkable surprise that uh, Jackie had uh, shared with us just on the fly like that. It was like, wow, thank you. That was a great compliment. And um, I felt it was truly a blessing from God to not only have one but both of the GAD co-founders um, attend and speak at our event. That was pretty awesome to have both Jenison and um, Joe Devon uh, make it out here. We were able to offer some really great prizes to people attending PWGAD. Uh, we had the Xbox One with adaptive controller, Toby Eye Tracker, uh, Apple iPods, and a couple of $500 NIC scholarships. And by the way, both those scholarship recipients are attending NIC this fall semester. And these prizes were made possible by the donations of Ednetics, Ken Wardinsky, Steve Smith, and yours truly. So some quick analytics on the event. Um, analytics are really hard on measuring anything with accessibility, but we did manage to, uh, we had a door clicker and somebody volunteering to click everybody that's coming in. Uh, with all the people that were coming in and, out, in and out of the day, 110 seemed low, but that's what the clicker um, recorded. And with YouTube, the live stream, we had uh, 282 views. So I'd like to take a quick moment just to talk a little bit about what we have uh, on the horizon for PWGAD 2020, and that's going to be April 27th and 28th. <clears throat> the biggest difference with PWGAD 2020 is the edu educational component, and the first day we're featuring speakers and trainers on various topics of accessibility and universal design. Second day is uh, kind of like the first day, but that's where we're also having the exhibition hall uh, running parallel to some workshops. We have four really great speakers that are already confirmed. So um, I, pro I feel pretty confident we just had these speakers, but um, I'm reaching out to just as great speakers um, and just get waiting to hear word back. So we have Tom Kriegelstein of SwiftKick, and he's going to be talking about <laughs> dance floor theory and how to enhance engagement. Um, for us, it's going to be accessibility. He's actually doing two talks, but we're doing accessibility. And it's dance floor theory is you kind of look at it every situation of increased engagement through a lens of a school dance. So the people lining the walls looking for that nearest exit, they're kind of like a zero as far as engagement. They're not going to be very engaged. Conversely, you got a person whose life at the party out there in the middle going crazy. Happy birthday comes on. They're like, yeah, this is my jam. Going crazy, having a great time, and, and really stirring the environment up. Uh, and we would like to see a zero become a six, but that's unrealistic. So another way to look at dance floor theory is a representation of a simple equation of x plus one, taking somebody's current level of engagement and take it up just a notch. And usually find that from there, it, everybody's builds up and they might end up going up a few notches by the time the event is done. And that's more realistic to just think, hey, we're just gonna bump everybody up a notch with engagement. <coughs> We're getting international participation from the American University of Beirut. Maha Zawehed of AUB will be sharing the challenges and strategies of organizing a multilingual international accessibility summit. So let me tangent here real quick. Um, I was actually fortunate to speak at the AUB ABLE Summit last April. And um, I really had no idea that the accessibility work that we were doing here at NIC would have such an impact internationally. They just loved everything that we were doing and it was so refreshing to see that. <clears throat> okay, back to the other speakers. Uh, Karina Mason Roris uh, will be sharing her perspective on accessibility in Idaho, Idaho higher education as the disability support director for ISU and the president of the Idaho Partnership of Higher Education and Disability, also known as IFED. And we got to come up with some shorter acronyms in this industry. <laughs> And Karina has also expressed a desire to be an exhibitor and a sponsor for PWGAD 2020, so we're very lucky to have her. Last but not least is Blair Williams of the Art Spirit Gallery here in Coeur d'Alene. 
and she has a great talk called Don't Fear the ADA and Not Being Accessible. I actually talked to Blair and when she shared her experiences and stories uh, with me, you know, I, I, I didn't ask her, I just kind of politely told her, your story is so good, we have to have you talk at PWGAD. So on this last slide, I have a picture of me standing on the steps of the Temple of Bacchus in Belbuck, <laughs> Lebanon, and I just want to thank everybody for the time and listening. And just take a quick moment to also thank Steve and Ken uh, for their impeccable leadership, the EIT committee for their guidance, and the PWGAG committee and volunteers who took a small idea and built it into a shared success. You know, this has been nothing or, um, short of God's blessing upon me to have this position at NIC, and I'm extremely grateful for all who have helped me leverage his blessing and making a meaningful difference. Other than that, um, I can answer any questions that uh, time will permit, or you can also email me at jeremy.seta at nic.edu. Wonderful. Thank you. Board, questions for Jeremy? Well, I'm just very impressed with your... I'm sorry, did you have... I'm just oh. listening. I'm just very impressed with your presentation. Thank you. Uh, um, you know... Those of us who don't deal with daily disabilities, we just go about our lives and we probably live in somewhat of a bubble. It's so exciting that you're bringing those speakers. Um, it's, it's good for all of us to understand what other people go through and accommodations that need to be made. I have a quick question mm -hmm. on accommodations, uh, and this is gonna seem so random, but I got asked the question today for, for something else. Do we have, um, accommodation anywhere on this campus with uh, uh, in a restroom with a changing room and a, and a uh, adult changing table do we have that anywhere not required by ADA I know this but I didn't know if it's just something now well, it's something to think about in the future so we can be even more accommodating yeah that's something I'll definitely uh, talk to Tim Gerlitz about Chris I do have one question if I may yeah. there, there was a discernible focus on the visually impaired and I did notice though you had the gaming system was that for not just visually impaired but could that have been somebody with like MS or Parkinson's or you know absolutely something like that ALS you know whatever absolutely I should have actually put a picture of the adaptive controller on there uh, it's it's quite a remarkable piece of hardware because it's has two large buttons. Um, it's kind of the old school Nintendo controllers with large buttons, but then there's about 20 different audio ports on the back, which you can then plug in something called like a switch, which is a button. So you can mount these buttons to, you know, use your legs to, you know, uh, tap the controller buttons and um, tap into the functionality of the system. You don't just have to use the traditional thumbs and you know fingers way of, of using a, one of those devices. So that's, yeah, it, it, the, access, the adaptive controller for the Xbox is, um, it's meant to be as universal as possible. If I may, one more question. Mm -hmm. Ballpark, you, you, you were estimating that the clicker recorded approximately 110 and you felt like maybe there was more. Of, of that number, how many folks there were disabled in some capacity? I hope that's the proper word in today's world, but you know, had some sort of impairment or were diminished in some way due to illness or injury or, or you know, whatever. That's an excellent question. So on, on one hand, uh, well, literally on one hand, I would say we had a handful of, of folks that you could tell um, had some sort of disability, but there's a lot of hidden disabilities that sure. are difficult for us to assess. So I have, I have no idea, again, analytics are so difficult with accessibility. I just know that the, that number uh, was probably much higher than the ones you could actually see. Okay. President McLennan. Thank you. I, thank you. <laughs> and thank, thank you, you Jeremy. I, <laughs> I'm not too surprised at Jackie's comment. I, I seem to remember a presentation you gave to Cabinet. I think it was Cabinet, maybe a year or so ago. Uh, and I thought your mission statement was something like world domination. <laughs> you ask me every time if I've achieved it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, I, I say uh, uh, your for, your international trip is certainly uh, getting you in that in that direction. But you know, I, and I just want to remind the board. I think you all will recall that back in the very olden days, when line item funding uh, was something that we did receive, 
Um, that's how Jeremy's role came to uh, be uh, because of the significant state support that we received uh, to support uh, building our accessibility footprint in this important digital world. And it's not just in the digital world, it's in, all, it's in, it's in many aspects of uh, making um, the, the services and the programs we have more accessible to the public, uh, to the community that we serve. And, um, and, and that, that support from the state uh, is you're just seeing it expressed in a very small way in this presentation. And I, uh, I mentioned that because I mentioned in the, in the earlier workshop the comments that we received from the uh, mock accreditation team, uh, and that was in the context of bu budget and fiscal health. Uh, but the second thing they said was that we need to celebrate some of the very special, unique things about North Idaho College. Mm -hmm. And we have so many, and you're seeing another example of one of the best in class efforts in this uh, scope. And it's really Jeremy's leadership in, the, in his uh, world conquest mission that he has to, to bring this to us. We're very, very fortunate and lucky to have you on our team. Thank you, President Agreed. McClendon. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you all. Thank you. Well, that brings us to our special business, election of officers. And before we get started, I want to tell all of you I have enjoyed the last two years of being board chair. All good things don't last forever. Um, I'm not really go I'm, I'm only expected to move a few chairs down, but I am excited to uh, pass the reins on to such a deserving other board members. So um, I would like to make a motion to nominate Joe Dunlap for board chair. So I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second it. I have a second by Trustee Howard. Discussion? Well, I, why don't I do the motions all at once? Will that work? Want to do a clean slate? Mm -hmm. Yes. OK. So I'll make a second motion. I'd like to, um, I'd like to nominate Ken Howard for vice chair. Do I have a second to that motion? I'll second that. Trustee Banducci. Um, and I understand that you're quite comfortable where you're at. And so I'm going to make a motion to nominate uh, Brad Murray. Should have been here, Brad. Um, for uh, Secretary Treasurer. Do I have a second for that? I'll second that. All right. I have a motion and a second. Discussion on the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Congratulations, gentlemen. And at this time, I will move to my right. Was a hey, mm -hmm. Take that with you. Take this with me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Joe. Uh, thank you. With my military and everything going on, I just need to kind of stay low key. Well, thank you, trustees. I appreciate the uh, vote of confidence. And uh, Trustee Wood, thank you so much for this past year of your leadership uh, with the board. And Two the years, thank you. Well, I, yeah. I'm He's only thanking you for this year. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> but we'll have constituent uh, reports at this time. And uh, first up is Asnick with uh, Paul McLeod. Good evening, Chair Dunlap, members of the board, Pre President McLennan, and members of the audience. It's great to be here. And if I just could say real quick, congratulations, Joe. Um, you are very deserving and really excited to see you in that chair. So, Thank you. Well, next week we'll be having our last board meeting before Christmas break, which is, uh, is really exciting for us. Things are ramping up before the school year ends, and we're all very anxious for the break, um, but there's still a lot of things to do, so people are uh, keeping busy and uh, rushing to get the things done before, before the break starts. Last week we had our QPR training. Uh, QPR stands for uh, Question, uh, Persuade, Refer. It's a suicide prevention uh, training program, and it was, it, was in, it was an incredible success, and it was very valuable information. 
Um, really excited that so many people came. There was, I'd say, about uh, 40 to 50 people in that room uh, who went through this training. And we loved it so much, we want to incorporate it into our ASNIC student government uh, training at the beginning of the year. Uh, we're going to do a different take on it and do a little bit of a longer session, I think, as well. And uh, what we're also doing is we're uh, starting to put together our budget for the 2021 year, and we're really uh, making some progress with that, working with Steve uh, McGrody, who's been a fantastic help. We really couldn't do it without Steve. He's, uh, he's been helping us through this process, and I'm confident that uh, we're going to make some great decisions. It, we're struggling with the same uh, challenges that everyone else is with declining enrollment and with that uh, reduced fees to work with. So uh, we're going to be having to make some cuts here and there, but I'm confident that we'll make the right choices. Um, last week, we sent one of our senators, Brenna Sumi, to an ACUI conference, which was, uh, I, I, I had the opportunity to go last year, and it was a fantastic time, and I think Brenna had a, uh, she, a it was a great learning experience for her. She came back with uh, lots of enthusiasm and some wonderful ideas to bring to NIC. And I will be taking off, actually, tomorrow. I'll be leaving for LA. I'm heading to the Circle of Change. Uh, leadership conference and I'm really excited about that. Peter Soderberg, you may remember the last ASNIC president, he went on this conference and he had wonderful things uh, to say about it so um, I'm hoping that I have a similar experience. <clears throat> um, just wanted to remind everyone that we have our free bowling night uh, coming up on the 22nd. It's at River City Lanes from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Come for free pizza, soda, and lots of fun so make sure that uh, make sure that you are aware of that and go if you can. And another thing that I want to talk about is our St. Asnick uh, event that we're putting on. We do this every year. It's always a wonderful thing. It's something we do for the community. Um, it's, it really is uh, one of those fantastic things that we do. Uh, you have the opportunity to sign up using the sign up sheet and buy a gift for uh, family members in the community. They extended the deadline to this Monday to sign up, so if you haven't done it already, it really is a wonderful thing. We're putting on an event on December 3rd from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. where you'll be able to meet Santa, and we'll be giving out gifts and providing dinner. It's, it's really going to be an exciting time. So thank you all so much, and uh, if you have any questions for me, then I'll take them. More uh, questions for Paul? I just, could I have that sign-up sheet? Can I have one of those? Certainly. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Thanks. Any other questions or comments? So, so Paul, are you guys doing a, a takeover of the River City Lanes? I mean, it's pretty much. It's going to be really exciting. So. That's the 22nd from 6 to 8? The 22nd, so this, uh, this Friday. Okay. Mm -hmm. unfortunately, I, unfortunately, I won't be there. I'll be at uh, Circle of Change in L.A., so... <laughs> Bummed about that. <laughs> All right, thank you, Paul. Staff Assembly, Tom Green. Good evening, Chair Dunlap. Congratulations. I'm going to also echo Paul's uh, sentiments with, with you and, and Trustee Wood. Congratulations on your election, too, as well, with the city. Uh, very well deserved. Uh, I've got a short report tonight. Uh, we had a fantastic staff assembly meeting on nor uh, November 14th. Uh, Diana Renz, who's in the audience tonight, she came and uh, spoke to us. Of course, Diana is the <coughs> college's associate uh, vice president for planning and effectiveness. effectiveness. Uh, that's a somewhat daunting title, hard to say as well. Uh, so Diana there was there to explain and update staff on exactly how her office of planning and effectiveness, effectiveness supports and serves the college. Uh, Diana focused on some key areas, such as institutional research and reporting. Uh, this uh, one is especially near and dear to my heart, since I facilitate many of the public information requests that come into the college. Uh, oftentimes, these requests require in-depth uh, working with numbers, lists, Excel sheets, and other really intense analytics that intimidate me personally very much. Uh, so I'm able to hand these requests over to Diana and her crew to process, and for that I am deeply grateful. Uh, she also talked about assessment work and program review that 
her team handles. Uh, this is another area important to me personally since measurement can be a challenge in the communications field as well as for many other departments on college. Uh, measurement can be difficult, it can be a, uh, because, because it's sometimes hard to quantify the good work that's done at the college just as it is with businesses in the private sector. Uh, her team helps with that. Just one example that's affected my department, uh, all surveys now run through her, her office, which allows for more precision and focus. Uh, planning is a big part uh, of, of the work she does and her office does. Uh, just planning at all levels is an area uh, they contribute to immensely with this work. Um, and of course, the accreditation efforts that NIC is currently right in the middle of, she, her department is a big, a big part of that. Uh, Diana has a relatively small core team, but they regularly work closely with about 20 other NIC employees in a variety of areas, making it a truly collaborative effort. Um, we're all very appreciative of Diana coming to talk to us. And for anyone else who's thinking about coming to talk to us, if you come, I will say really nice things about you <laughs> at the uh, <laughs> Board of Trustees meeting. Uh, that's my report, unless there are any questions. Questions or comments for uh, Tom? No, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, Trustee Wood. Thank you. Um, Tom, well, it's kind of for you. Um, you mentioned planning, and we have so many plans, and Diana is doing a fabulous job with the, with the big picture of it. What I don't have is them at, the, at my fingertips, and I'm curious, can we have some of our plans that we've all looked at, and Stephen, in the last year, downloaded on our uh, iPads so we can have them? Would that be very difficult? Or do I have to go to the website myself? And I think <laughs> we're, Ken we're, Wardinsky's working on something. Uh, uh, oh. Yeah, and I was going to touch on that briefly in my comments, but I'll say it here. Uh, we have uh, so much of the work that we've been doing around planning uh, ready to go. And one of the uh, bits of feedback that we got from the mock accreditation visit team was we really just need to put a bow on it. And, and to your question, we are actually in the process right now of producing that document. Uh, I'm going to be emailing it to the board uh, within the next week or two and actually uh, moving to get it on the agenda for the uh, December board meeting uh, for, the, for your input and, and, and feedback uh, at that time. So that is coming. Okay, I'm just thinking about our different workshops through the year and I think I'd like to go back and I could dig through piles of paper or if I had it right here, that'd be great. You're, you're not alone. Okay, all right, thank you. Fantastic. And then one more thing, if I may, to Paul, I misunderstood. And I, I want to give a gift. I don't have any little kids, but he's, he's really old right now. So is it still, it was just go get an ornament, right? Yes. All right. Okay. I, I, I wasn't paying very good attention. All right. Any other questions or comments for Tom? Thank you, Tom. Thank you. For faculty assembly, Chris uh, Pelchat. Uh, good evening, Chair Dunlap, fellow board members, Dr. McLennan. Uh, at our November faculty assembly meeting, we began with a Senate report and a chair report. Uh, as the chair, I discussed that where we were with the timeline on developing a, a plan around how best to approach uh, putting leadership onto committees. I mentioned that last, last month, but we have a structured plan in place now that we were pretty excited about, so we're looking forward to that. <clears throat> We also discussed that the President's Advisory Council had adopted a charter and had plans to pass that through Senate uh, for approval and faculty were very happy to see some transparency around that particular group. So we're excited for that. Under new business, uh, we had e-learning come and talk to us about a new grading module that's going to be implemented in Canvas. Uh, that's going to take place in the spring. Uh, there's an opportunity right now for faculty to use it. Um, this semester but not everybody's doing it so we got an update on how that's going to work and what changes that was going to be uh, uh, for faculty. Uh, we also had uh, some information about where we are with accreditation presented to us um, and some discussion around the mock visit and how that related to faculty's contribution to that event and how we could better uh, support that that initiative in the spring um, so that was very insightful for faculty. Uh, there was also a motion brought forth to approve the revisions to policy and procedure number 3.0208, which involves faculty employment. Uh, there was some lively debate around this policy and procedure, 
and that debate resulted in the motion failing to adopt that policy and procedure. Um, and we did come up with some guidelines for editing that and sent it back. And we're looking forward to those edits coming back to assembly at the next meeting. Uh, we also had a discussion about policy and procedure 3.02X, which is a combination of multiple policies around staff evaluation. Uh, this, some faculty felt strongly that she had <coughs> input in this policy and procedure. Uh, but currently, since it's focused on staff, uh, faculty assembly doesn't have voting rights on it, but faculty do have voting rights in the Senate itself. And so we were advising any faculty that might have issues with the policy procedure to give them to the faculty reps on the Senate to have those discussions um, at that level. Uh, at the end of the meeting for remarks of the good order, or for the order, good of the order, uh, several faculty took that opportunity to share some uh, interesting events that are coming up over the next month. Uh, to participate in. And other than that, uh, that is the extent of my report. Questions from the board? Questions, comments for Chris? Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you. Chris. Yep. Senate, Ben Tashida. Chair Dunlap, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Christy, thank you for your service over the last year. I appreciate that. And uh, Chair Dunlap, thank you for stepping up. I know serving in the chair role, as I've uh, experienced <laughs> this year, is, is quite an undertaking. So thank you for stepping up for that. Um, so the Senate meet, met on October 31st. Uh, we reviewed two policies and procedures at that time. Uh, the first one was the uh, Electronic Information Technology Accessibility Policy and Procedure, which you'll see tonight. Uh, we approved that one. Uh, and then followed that up with the uh, creation, revision, and elimination of college policy and procedure, specifically the procedure document. Uh, we've been working on that one for quite a while. Uh, we did get that finished up and forwarded that one on to the president. Um, uh, after that meeting, uh, we had a couple of things that uh, occurred. Uh, we did have, uh, it was about seven members, I believe, that participated in the mock accreditation visit, uh, specifically from the Senate. Um, I was there as well, um, and uh, that was a good meeting. I think the, the senators that were there, along with myself, uh, found it valuable. Um, and then tomorrow, we have our next Senate meeting. Uh, we have uh, a couple of policies and procedures that I'll note specifically. Um, there's the employee development policy and procedure um, as well as the staff profes professional development policy, uh, no, sorry, staff pro uh, professional development plan, uh, the procedures up for review. Uh, those particular documents, because they deal with uh, employee terms, uh, terms of employment, um, they do have specific voting rights, um, which isn't something that we've had uh, come up this year or even in the last couple of years. So uh, we'll start off with a review of, of those specific voting rights before going into the discussion. Um, discussion will be open to all senators, uh, but uh, as an example, the staff, uh, professional development uh, plan procedure will only be open to voting by staff members. Um, the employee development uh, has been determined to impact uh, staff and faculty, so it will require both a majority of staff members as well as a majority of faculty members for each motion pertaining to that one. So uh, that is my report. Thank you, Ben. Any uh, questions or comments for Ben? Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, thank you Ben. <clears throat> Uh, next, we'll have the president's report, Dr. McLennan. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, recognizing uh, our outstanding, uh, the outstanding work of our business and finance team, both in preparing uh, the college and this board for our work on the FY21 uh, budget and, uh, and for helping lead the uh, workshop that we, you all participated in earlier this evening. I'd also like, to, you'll hear later on, in the meeting, uh, acceptance uh, of another very positive uh, fiscal audit, um, many in a row now. Uh, but I just want to recognize the many folks behind the scenes uh, who aren't often seen but who do a lot and work tirelessly uh, to keep us uh, in good uh, financial health. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge uh, Dr. Lita Burns. How about that? Lita was uh, the keynote speaker at yesterday's American Association of Women and Community Colleges uh, meeting. She was invited to speak. She spoke on the topic of the power of gratitude, which is a very fitting topic for Dr. Burns. And she was also recognized for her contributions in helping women find opportunities uh, and has done so consistently 
uh, for leadership and growth here at North Idaho College. Um, I want to thank uh, Trustee Banducci for joining us last evening for the annual scholarship celebration and presentation of the 2019 Alumni uh, Awards. Uh, that is just always such a nice e event. Uh, Rail, I think she's in the back of the room, and her team do just an outstanding job of, of queuing up some of the most uh, powerful speakers. The stories that our students and our alumni tell um, are just amazing. In particular, I mean, they were all great. I just wanted to highlight one. Josh Gittle, uh, who is alumni of the uh, of the year, uh, you know, if, I don't think Josh is here this evening, but um, you know, he's a senior accountant, works here. He's a alumni of uh, North Idaho College, ASNIC, past ASNIC president, and uh, he's not a real extrovert in terms of uh, getting out and speaking in public. And he acknowledged that last night in his comments, and then went on to deliver just an absolutely fabulous. Uh, story about his experience at North Idaho College and how it's impacted his life, uh, the life of his family, and what a joy it is for him to be a part of the NIC family uh, as an employee. But overall, just a great event. Uh, one of the nice features was uh, Rael asked all of our students who are in attendance to stand, and we had about 100 in the room, and they all have different stories. And, and seated at the tables with the donors of, the respect of many of our uh, scholarships, uh, to share um, their experiences is just a very, it's just a neat way to do it. So, Rail, thank you. Um, <clears throat> while we're doing recognition, you all have a uh, copy of the Spokane Coeur d'Alene Living Magazine, and I think uh, it's worth noting that North Idaho College was listed as the best college university in Idaho, according to this publication, and we're in pretty good company. I think Gonzaga uh, received the gold uh, mention in Washington, and uh, there's a, there's, it's noted in the, uh, in the magazine, but you have a copy of that. Oh, well, Ms. Dr. McLennan, we're not quite done with that magazine, <laughs> because we have something here as well. Oh, um, so, one of the Power 50 most influential people in our community, Richard McLennan, Coeur d'Alene number three. You were awarded by the same group of individuals, and I think that's fantastic. Wonderful recognition. I'm going to put this right in front of you. Oh, jeez. Look at it all night long. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Good work. Thank you. I uh, mentioned the mock accreditation uh, visit and uh, just talked a little bit about planning. Uh, I mentioned earlier, but I'll say it here publicly, that uh, there were several very nice comments uh, made by the team as they exited. I mentioned our fi the, 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 the fiscal health of the college, but also, as I mentioned earlier, that the, the many stories that we have to share that we think we know now that from these outside eyes coming in to take a look at us and the report that we've been creating over the last year, that we, we can do more with that, that there's so many wonderful things happening in North Idaho College that are special and unique about North Idaho College that speak to our mission fulfillment, which is what accreditation is about. Um, but overall, and I think you've heard a couple comments here from the uh, constituent leaders, um, the, the goal of having people experience the outside view of the story we're trying to tell and where we might have some gaps with that and the feedback we got from that was realized as a result of the mock visit. So I guess I want to also want to say I appreciate everybody's participation in that. We still have a lot of work to do. I've um, got some work, I have a little bit of work to do with the board and I'll be talking with uh, uh, Chair Dunlap about that. And I want to thank uh, Chair Dunlap and uh, Trustee Howard for participating in, in, the, uh, in the interview with, with that uh, mock accreditation visit. Lastly, uh, had the opportunity this morning to climb on the bus and say bon voyage to our uh, women's uh, volleyball team. They're uh, headed to SeaTac. They're going to be uh, or Tacoma. They'll be playing in the Tacoma Dome for the championship. Uh, they're heading there undefeated. We certainly hope they stay that way. But most of all, we want them to have a good time and, and enjoy the experience. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. McLennan. Any uh, questions or comments for uh, Dr. McLennan? Nope. None? 
All right, it looks like I'm up next with a Meyer Health and Science Building Expansion Update, and there is no update on that that I have, unless, Chris, you have anything. I'll just add that uh, today we had our first design development meeting, taking into consideration the feedback that the board gave us um, for the direction moving forward. So that first meeting happened today. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is under old business is athletic program uh, summary. And uh, Trustee Wood, did you have uh, anything to report on that? Um, you, you know, not exactly on um, what I was going to report on, but I would like to take this opportunity and maybe uh, Dr. McLennan could help. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the communities asked us, a few people have asked us about a possible feasibility of going back to the National Conference for Sustaining the NWAC. And we wanted to talk a little bit about what's happening um, and explain um, what our thoughts are on that. And I'll open it up to all the trustees and, and Dr. McLennan. Would you like me to? Yes. Okay. So thank you, uh, Trustee Wood. And I'm going to probably drag uh, Dr. Stanley into this conversation a little bit. But, but um, as you're all aware, we've had uh, some interest uh, really since we made the change, both in not making the change in conferences and then ultimately uh, subsequently returning uh, to the conference. And uh, most recently, in, the, in light of the NWAC uh, experience that we had last year, um, uh, a lot more visibility on that topic and, and to the extent that the board has received some formal uh, input and recommendations uh, to revisit that. Since that time, since then, we've learned that the NWAC has been approached by the NJCAA uh, with a request to, uh, for the NWAC to join the NJCAA as a part of that national conference. Uh, and I, I'm not going to get all of the timing exactly right on that, but it will be a conversation that will take place, I believe, a decision to be made in 2000, in spring of 2020? 2021. 2021. Uh, so it's a, it's a fairly involved process. There'll be a lot of stakeholder meetings and fact-finding and um, uh, educational uh, uh, meetings and, and presentations for the various colleges and presidents so that uh, that uh, the NWAC can ha go through a, a process to make that decision. In light of that, uh, that would be something that I think we would be interested in. It would still regionalize play to a large extent. There are a lot of uh, things that have to happen uh, for this to, to uh, be uh, accepted by NWAC. But I, I think it's going to be prudent for us to participate in that conversation uh, as we go through this before really examining going back, uh, flipping conferences. It wouldn't be a, my recommendation to do that at, at this point. Trustee, <coughs> um, after the last uh, meeting, all of the trustees received a um, brochure. Uh, advocating returning to the N Y or to the NJCAA, and it was um, fairly um, well put together argument, and um, members of the community had um, invited us to re-examine whether or not we would go back to the NJCAA. But in light of the developments, where uh, NJCAA has invited NWAC to join their ranks. Um, I think that it would be prudent, as recommended by the president, for us to kind of table consideration of that proposal until we see what happens with the um, joinder of N NWAC with NJCAA. If that happens through the process that is presently being examined, then uh, we're where the, the proposal wants to take us. If not, then we can consider at that time whether that suits the needs of North Idaho College. So I, wanna, uh, I want to personally thank uh, the efforts that went into making that proposal and the people who are interested in the athletic programs here at, at um, NIC for the effort that they put into it. Um, and we'll just have to wait to see how it all turns out. Okay. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments? Nope. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, an action item, Information Technology Accessibility Policy, and uh, that's Ken Wardensky. Good evening, Chair Dunlap, 
And member trustees, uh, I stand before you for the second reading of policy 3.08.09 regarding the information technology accessibility, which I have strategically timed with the paving the way for GAD success event. <laughs> I'll stand for any questions. Uh, I would make if there. I would make a motion, since it's a second reading, to accept the electronic information technology accessibility policy. I'll second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we accept uh, the second reading of the policy. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, we'll call the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you, Ken. Thank Good you. work. Under new business, we have uh, an action item, and that is uh, to accept the 2019 fiscal audit. And uh, Chris Martin. Chair Dunlap, members of the board, I uh, come before you this evening uh, requesting acceptance of the FY19 fiscal audit. Um, just as a background, the college engages Ide Bailey of Boise as our external auditor to conduct this audit. Um, we did conduct an audit exit conference uh, this afternoon with um, Trustee Dunlap, Trustee Howard, and President McLennan, along with Sarah Garcia, our controller. At this time, I'd like to invite Barry Weber, um, our audit manager, up to address any questions regarding the audit. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good evening, trustees, Dr. McLennan. Uh, before we dive into the nitty-gritty here, um, I'd just like to echo Dr. McLennan's comments with regards to the team here, uh, Chris, Sarah, Sandra, um, and the team in the business office. Uh, audits are hard, right? It's a lot. You know, there's 75 pages here, um, and they have to get us everything we need and respond to all of our questions while still doing their day job. Um, and the team here does a fantastic job every year. So this is the fifth year uh, I've been on this audit. I think I'd Bailey is on this audit. Um, when we first came in, the big push from the team here was best practices. You know, where, where can we improve our processes um, that really be kind of the, the best in higher education? And, you know, we're sitting here today, and I know the partner, Jody Doherty, would agree with me that this team is the best practice. Um, of the 10 or so educational institutions and 50 or so clients that I work with, during the year, this is one of, if not the best team. Um, they're responsive, they're clean. It's very straightforward for our audit process, which is always much appreciated. So uh, as I'm sure all of you want to read all 75 pages, um, we're just gonna highlight kind of the key points and then I'll ask uh, for questions. I know Josh Gittle in the business office would be very disappointed if you didn't read through the entire pension disclosure, but. We're gonna, we're gonna skim over that. So uh, we'll start with uh, page three. If you wanna flip to that, it's kind of the primary report that we issue after all this work. Yeah, it's three pages. So uh, top of page three is our opinion. So this is what's called an unmodified opinion, a clean opinion. It effectively says that the financial statements within this packet are materially correct. So it's the, the best overall opinion we can give. So that's kind of the key point there. Uh, if you want to flip to page 14, 15, and 16, these are what primarily we focus on, which is your, effectively your balance sheet and your P&L. Um, the only thing I like to point out here, obviously you can look through and ask me any questions, or I'm sure Chris, any questions. The one thing I like to point out in here relates to other post-employment benefits and per cease, um, the pension. Uh, so if you look up on page 14, about right towards the end there, the, the last three lines there, there's some pension obligation items. So this is an asset. It's effectively between all the per seat items and the healthcare plan. Actuaries come up with an estimate of what our share, and I see share, of all these liabilities and assets are. So it's not necessarily, these aren't assets you can spend. They're not liabilities. The state's not gonna come. If you look about uh, halfway down page 15, you'll see a net pension liability of 4.7 million. The state's not gonna come ask for 4.7 million. Effectively, this is an estimate of if the pension system were shut off today, how much would you have to pay over the next however many years until that system would phase out for people that have already accrued that benefit. <coughs> 
So the key point there is that this is going to impact your financials. It's not going to impact your day to day. You're going to continue to make your pension payments. Um, I know a lot of boards will ask those questions of, you know, why is our liability so high? Do we owe that? You're just going to continue making your pension payments. So that's always going to impact this. Um, on page 16, it's buried within here, um, but we do like to point out the impact from the actuarial change year over year. So the actuary comes up with their estimates on the liabilities. Um, the change this year was about a $1.5 million benefit to NIC. So when we see that, that third to last line there, change in net position, what is effectively your net income, about 1.5 million of that is purely an accounting change. It's the actuary going through and saying, based on useful, you know, how long people are gonna live, inflation rates, salary increases, how the investments are doing, uh, NIC's liability is $1.5 million less this year. So I always like to point that out as give it some context as to what that bottom line looks like. In terms of the rest of the financials, not a whole lot of change. There's no new guidance this year. The last few years we've had some of those new pension, other post-employment benefits that have kind of had restatements. None of that this year. The only real change is on page 19. And what this is, is this year the college switched to a self-employed health care plan. And so those are effectively restricted funds. So the, the collected, the amounts collected from employees minus the amounts paid. So the cash here, 541000 is restricted cash that is the excess collected versus what has been paid during the year. The 531000 liability is the projection from the actuary of what you would be required to pay based on incidents that occurred June 30 or prior. So if you cut it off at June 30, you'd still have to pay 531,000 estimated, leaving in a position of about 10,000. And the idea here is these are all restricted funds rolling into 2020, discussion of to move those into a trust or not and how to account for those. That'll be something I know Chris will address. And then the following page is just that uh, income statement related to that fund. So the employee contributions, page 20, less the claims, the administrative expenses for regents um, administering those claims, and then the change in IBNR there, that's that estimate of what you would be required to pay should, you know, based on items that happened prior to June 30. So those two pages there are really the only changes. Um, the accounting policies are pretty consistent. The footnotes are pretty consistent. Um, I'll, we'll wrap up here in a second, and you're welcome to ask me any questions. The only other two pages I'll point out, if you want to flip to the back of the statement, pages 68. Oh, we'll start with 66, actually. And so page 66 is our report on internal controls, and this is kind of what I mentioned earlier, but it's a clean report. So we go through and do test of designs of all the processes within the college. So it's not going to be quite as extensive as an SEC control audit. But we do go through and say, you know, what are the processes related to all the financial items? Are they designed effectively? Um, and through that process, we make recommendations of where we think improvements there were no deficiencies that we noted in our testing. So very clean report in terms of processes, internal controls. Uh, page 68 is our report over, <coughs> excuse me, our report over the federal programs, so the schedule of expenditures of federal awards. And this is also a clean report. So no issues within the compliance side over the federal funds. Page 70 lists all those federal funds, how much were expended during the year. And the requirements for those on the audit side is that we audit uh, student financial aid is required every year. And on the other side, any programs over 750,000, which for NIC is uh, Head Start and Aging, we have to audit once every three years. So Head Start was audited last year, aging two years ago. So next year uh, we'll be aging again. So this year the only one audited was student financial aid. And purely from a compliance standpoint. Those balances are still within the financial side, but this is the additional compliance requirements. And just to give a, a little bit of context, um, I have no idea how many colleges, universities, I'd Bailey um, audits. It's, it's definitely dozens. Uh, it's very rare that I see reports that don't have any findings. So um, kudos to Stephanie House in the Student Financial Aid Office. 
Um, if you've ever seen the uh, compliance listing for student financial aid, it'll, it'll put you to sleep pretty quickly. So um, a lot of those are, are key and, and most institutions are able to meet those. A lot of them are very minor about what date is reported when and all those kind of items. Uh, it's rare that we don't see any findings. So very impressive on that end. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to any questions from anyone. Board, questions or comments? A comment. Yeah, Trustee Wood. Mr. Chair. Uh, well, just once again, our, our staff deserves tremendous credit. When you come in and say we have a nice, clean, pretty audit, we like that very much. <laughs> and we know how hard you all work to make it like this. So thank you for the professionalism you show year after year. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, do I uh, have a motion to accept the 2019 audit? I'd like to move to accept the audit for 2019. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to accept the uh, 2019 annual audit. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, we've got the uh, first reading of the intellectual property policy by Dr. McLennan. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Uh, so the background, I'm just going to go ahead and read the tab. The intellectual property policy presented is a new policy for North Idaho College that was developed by a committee of faculty and staff. The purpose of the policy is to govern the creation and use of intellectual property at North Idaho College, including the production of goods and services which copyright, trademark, and patents protect. The intellectual property policy and procedure were written in conjunction with the copyright policy and followed the same development process. They've been reviewed and approved by faculty assembly, administrative council, president's cabinet, and the college senate. Mr. Lyons and his staff have reviewed and had input to the policy as it is presented. Uh, this policy is written as broadly as possible, covering traditional elements of intellectual properties in higher education and to cover emerging areas such as entrepreneurship and innovation. Board members, questions or comments regarding the proposed policy? Uh, Dr. McLennan, I notice uh, it says first reading slash action. And so uh, is there a timeline needed for approval? Uh, so the, this is presented for your decision. You, you may act on it. We, we modified the agenda uh, uh, just a while back to accommodate that interest, but there's not a, it, there's no, it's got to be done today if the board needs another month to come back for a second reading, um, that's, that's perfectly fine. Is, is there any, uh, board members, is there any uh, reason to not approve the policy tonight? Yeah, Trustee Howard. Um, I don't know that I have a reason not to approve it tonight, but I th I think we adopted the policy of a first and second reading, not just to allow us to consider these things, but also outside individuals who may hear about them for the first time. And if there is no need to move on it tonight, I'd like to stick with our general policy of affor affording opportunity, although we very seldom hear anything, <laughs> affording opportunity uh, mm -hmm. to, for people to reflect on it. Okay. Uh, President McLennan, can you bring that back next? Next Absolutely. And, and again, the, the, the intent of the language on the agenda was really more of a technical fix for a really a one-off every now and then challenge where we, we would have needed to, to act. And so um, we'll happily bring this back. Okay. Thank you. And <clears throat> we now have a, a resolution for use of real property. Um, Chris, are you going to read the uh, resolution or, or Trustee Wood, are you... I'm happy to, or whatever you'd prefer. All right. uh, well, it's got you listed on the agenda. Uh, All right. Um, do you want me to go through the background? Or just? Sure. All right. Um, the college owns a number of properties around Kootenai County used to directly deliver education or in support of the delivery of education and in alignment with the college master plan. 
Uh, with continued acquisition of real property, the board has discussed the need to formally designate that all real property holdings are for educational use or to be used in support of the delivery of education. With that, we would like board action recommending that the board consider a motion to adopt a resolution designating the use of real property for educational use or in support of the college mission. I do, I can read this if you'd like. That's the same thing. Same thing, okay. Yeah. I'd like to make a motion that we adopt the resolution. Uh, is there a second to that? I'd second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Chris, would you uh, like to discuss the resolution? Just, just don't want to stand for any questions that anyone had regarding this. I don't. No. It's, it's clear to me. Okay. Yeah. I, the college is constantly looking around for um, how we can improve the, the college, and, and the, this is simply a statement of our intent with regard to um, actions that we take so that people aren't con uh, concerned about the fact that we're going to open a, a, a gas station or hotel. something, or a hotel yeah. on the property, unless it's for educational purposes. So the, there is a direct comment by the board in terms of approving whatever acquisitions we have that to be, to be used for education. It's to lay down a marker, I think, for future, future use if necessary. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, hearing none, uh, all in favor of approving the motion uh, to approve the resolution designating all property for educational use and support all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thank you. Let's see, lastly, uh, board chair report. And uh, I don't have a lot to report tonight. <laughs> However, uh, I would uh, like to say that uh, we've got Thanksgiving coming up next week. And I hope all of you have an opportunity to spend time with your family and your loved ones. And uh, you give some reflection to those things that you are thankful for. I know uh, one of the major things I'm thankful for is uh, the employees and the students of this college and everything you do for this community, which is huge. So thank all of you. Uh, the only other thing I, I, I want to mention, well, I guess two other things. One is that uh, our board meeting scheduled for December uh, is uh, off schedule. It will be on December 16th as opposed to the third uh, Wednesday, I think that's right, third Wednesday of the, the month, and uh, it's, on a, it's on a Monday. And then uh, lastly, uh, I'd like to thank Jake and, you know, for attending, uh, representing the governor's office and bringing that report. Thank you very much. Um, and that's all I have for my report. And uh, are there any other uh, comments for the good of the order? Trustee Howard. I guess I'd just like to make sure that we recognize and congratulate uh, Christy for her election oh, to the city council and hopefully they'll listen to us more closely in the future. <laughs> I will pass that along. <laughs> uh, well put. Any other uh, comments for the good of the order? Uh, with that, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.